Today we're visiting the site where a little over a century ago, the United States was invaded by a foreign army, an event that's been largely forgotten today, Pancho Villa's raid on Columbus, New Mexico. Hey everyone, welcome to Sidetrack Adventures. This is Steve. Right now I'm in Southern New Mexico, and in fact, about as far south as we can get. But where I'm standing, in the early morning hours of March 9th, 1916, Pancho Villa's Villa Estas came through here to raid the town of Columbus, New Mexico. This would end up being the last invasion by foreign forces of the continental United States, and it led to a major battle. With 10 civilians, eight U.S. Army soldiers, and at least 63 of Pancho Villa's men being killed. So today, we're going to take a look around Pancho Villa State Park and the town of Columbus. It doesn't appear to be that busy here so far today, as we're the only ones in the parking lot for the visitor center right now. This park and Columbus are located south of Deming, a few miles north of the border with Mexico. I admittedly didn't know a whole lot about Pancho Villa and the raid on Columbus before I started looking into it once I knew we were coming out here. It feels like the raid and the punitive expedition by the army to hunt him down in Mexico are largely forgotten today. It was a huge deal at the time, and in a way, it was the end of the Old West and the transition into modern warfare. Let's start out by heading up this hill, which is named Coots Hill, to kind of get a lay of the land. This hill was right where the action was on March 9th, 1916. The land around it, and now the land that makes up the Pancho Villa State Park, was part of the Army's Camp Furlong. Pancho Villa was a key figure in the Mexican Revolution that lasted from 1910 to 1920. I don't think this hill is big enough to go over the Mexican Revolution in detail, but by late 1914 and early 1915, Pancho Villa was an extremely popular figure, and the United States considered recognizing him as the legitimate authority in Mexico. There's a famous photo from 1914 that shows Pancho Villa and General Pershing, the man who would later be charged with hunting him down, posing and smiling together. In that same photo, the person standing behind Pershing is often misidentified as future General George Patton, but it's actually James Lawton Collins, future general and father of Apollo 11 astronaut Michael Collins. The United States actually backed Pancho Villa for a bit and helped him get weapons, but ultimately, instead of backing Villa, the U.S. ended up backing one of his rivals, Venustiano Carranza. After Carranza defeated Pancho Villa's forces at the Second Battle of Agua Prieta, Pancho Villa was not very happy with the United States. Which leads us to the raid here on Columbus. So we've about reached the top of Coots Hill, and I was right, there's a great view of everything from up here. There's a couple of benches to sit and admire the view. That in front of us is the campground for the state park. But if we look just to the right of it, that's the direction Pancho Villa's men came from when they raided the town. And about two and a half miles or so in the distance, that's Mexico. There's a good view of the town from up here as well. Before the raid, Pancho Villa supposedly sent scouts ahead to see how many soldiers were here. And the scouts came back and said there were only about 30 soldiers. In reality, the 13th Cavalry Regiment was stationed here with over 350 soldiers. On the night of the attack, however, about half were on patrol or on other assignments. Just after midnight on March 9, 1916, somewhere between 400 and 600 Villaistas crossed the border from Mexico and began their approach to Columbus. Villa separated his men into two groups and launched his attack on the town and camp at around 4.15 a.m. The Via Estas traveled around this hill, with one column heading into the army camp and the other heading towards the town. 
The town was soon awakened with the shouts of Viva Villa and Via Mexico as the Villaistas began to loot and burn the town. Let's head back down the hill and take a walk around the park while we talk about the battle and see what else there is to see. A lot of the park looks to be taken up by the campground, but there are a few buildings and a museum. Despite the surprise attack, it wasn't long before the U.S. Army was in the fight. 2nd Lieutenant John P. Lucas, who commanded the 13th Cavalry's machine gun troop, ran barefooted from his quarters to the camp's barracks, where he put together a defense around the camp's guard tent, where the machine guns were kept. During the 90-minute battle, the four machine guns fired more than 5,000 rounds apiece. This is the old customs house. During the time of the raid, the train ran along what is now New Mexico Highway 9. This was built in 1901, so it survived the attack. Pancho Villa's men burned about a city block of Columbus. There's some debate as to where Pancho Villa himself was during the raid. Some reports say he took part in it, others that he watched everything from Coots Hill where we were earlier, and some claim he wasn't even here. There's the old train station across the street. The Historical Society is located there now, but we'll head over there in just a bit. This is the Camp Furlong Recreation Hall up ahead. I believe this was built a few months after the raid, when thousands of soldiers came here to hunt Pancho Villa. The raid on Columbus lasted about 90 minutes, until a bugle sounded and the Villaistas headed back towards Mexico. A group of soldiers led by Major Frank Tompkins pursued the withdrawing Villaistas until they were about 15 miles into Mexico, before withdrawing back across the border after running low on ammunition and water. When all was said and done, 10 civilians and 8 U.S. Army soldiers were killed, 15 soldiers were wounded, and at least 63 Villaistas were killed, though some places put the number as high as 170. Seven Villaistas were taken prisoner, and six of them were hanged. While we're on this side of the park, we might as well head inside the museum and take a look around. Despite the heavy casualties on the Mexican side, the battle was portrayed in the papers at the time as a victory for Pancho Villa, and he became enemy number one for the United States. Villa did capture a lot of much needed equipment in the raid, but he never recovered from losing so many men and never regained much power. In response to the attack, National Guard units from around the United States were called up, and by the end of August 1916, over 100,000 troops were on the border. A punitive expedition led by General John J. Pershing to track down and capture or kill Villa began, and the U.S. Army entered Mexico. The expedition was really a transition period for warfare, as it was the last time the cavalry used horses in combat, and it was the beginning of mechanized warfare, with the army using trucks and airplanes in combat for the first time. The army searched northern Mexico for six months, but Villa was not found. In January 1917, with intense diplomatic pressure from Mexico and the United States likely to enter World War I soon, the army withdrew from Mexico. General Pershing would go on to lead the U.S. Army in World War I and would eventually be named General of the Armies, the highest rank in the U.S. military and a rank that's only been awarded three times. The two others are George Washington and Ulysses S. Grant. Pancho Villa negotiated a peace settlement with the Mexican government in 1920. He was then assassinated in 1923, most likely on the orders of Mexico's president. Here's a bit of automotive history. It's the first grease rack installed by the U.S. Army, 
to service cars engaged in combat. Here's the old Judge Advocate's office. We're near the campground now and there's a dog that does not want us over here. <laughs> there's not too many people in the campground today. Probably because of how cold it is. And don't be fooled by my short sleeve shirt. Everyone else is bundled up for the winter. Here's an old loading ramp. Aside from the area near the museum, there isn't a lot to see at the park. Most of it's taken up by the campground. So let's go check out some of the town. Here's the old train station. It's actually closed today, unfortunately. But as I mentioned earlier, this road is where the train tracks once were. Here are a couple old call booths that would have been located along the railroad. Here's a replica of where Pershing did a troop review from. And here's a monument to those killed in the raid. The civilians are listed on this side. And the soldiers that were killed are here on the opposite side. Across the street is the part of town that took the brunt of the assault. Here's the still empty block that was burned down during Pancho Villa's raid. Nothing's left of the old bank but the vault, which looks like it's been turned into a shrine. After the raid, all the women and children in town were moved here to the Hoover Hotel. Really everything having to do with the raid is concentrated within a few blocks. One of the questions I had before coming here was why is the park named after Pancho Villa? He invaded the United States and killed 18 Americans. Not to mention that he had 16 Americans pulled from a train in Mexico and executed a few months before the raid on Columbus. The park was named in 1959 and the name was proposed by Jack Breen who was a deputy sheriff in Columbus at the time of the attack. It was said the name was a gesture of goodwill to the Mexican people. Naming the park for Pancho Villa was pretty controversial at the time, and at one point someone put up a sign that said, Quien Sabe State Park in protest, which means, who knows State Park. Eventually the argument that the raid is what Columbus is most known for, and the name isn't meant to memorialize Villa, but just to add meaning to the park won out. It was also argued that, like Billy the Kid, eventually time turns outlaws into heroes. So that's our look at Columbus, New Mexico, Pancho Villa's Raid, and Pancho Villa State Park. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up, consider subscribing, and we'll see you next week.